Yeah, I will for preaching, but I won't need it for the welcome and intro. That'd be a good idea. Well, good morning, and welcome to Northwest Free Methodist Church. Um, we're so thankful that we get to be in this space here at Reflection Ridge. Um, we're thankful for the, the warm welcome and the invitation that you all have extended to us. Um, we are a Free Methodist congregation, and if you don't know what that means, that's okay. Um, we're going to, hopefully, you'll explore with us as we uh, continue to meet here on Sunday mornings. Um, we have a few announcements uh, before we get started with singing. Um, we as a church are working on our mission and vision, so for those who are regular attenders and those who are new, we are working on what, who we are as a unique church here in Wichita, um, and so we're going to be developing that over the course of the next few weeks, um, and so for, we're going to be meeting at, we have a co-working office space, we're going to be meeting at, um, starting October 11th at 7, 7 p.m., and we're going to establish mission, vision, values, all that sort of stuff, um, and we're going to develop that. Um, the next announcement is giving. If you want to give, there is no pressure. You do not have to give. Um, but if you want to give, you can give online or there is an offering plate at the back right as you leave. Um, and we give out an abundance of what Jesus has blessed us with. And so if you want to give, uh, you're more than welcome to, but there is no pressure to give as well. Um, our call to worship this morning is from Psalm 25, 5 through 9. Make me to know your ways, O Lord. Teach me your paths. Lead me in your truth and teach me, for you are the God of my salvation. For you I wait all day long. Gabe is going to lead us in singing. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. I, I'm still waking up, so I need that good morning. <laughs> well, uh, like Pastor said, I thank you all, at least for coming and joining us on this wonderful Sunday. This is going to be our very first service here, so we're just going to rock it out. I invite you all to stand if you are able and we can start worshiping this Sunday. Take my place That you would 
Will you join me in prayer? Lord, we thank you for this time of gathering, that we get to worship you, that we get to express our gratitude of your mercy and grace. We ask that you be with us as we gather together, and then as we leave this place, that you would guide us, that you would be with us. We keep those in prayer of those who are dealing with sickness and health issues, that your presence and your healing hand would be upon them. We pray for those who are working through difficult situations, challenges of family, friends, that your hand and your presence would be there, that your peace would guide them. We pray for these things in Jesus' name. Amen. We are going to uh, have a little children's lesson, um, and so my wife Mackenzie is going to be doing it, um, and they are, so if we can have all the kids come gather right down here. They're being shy now. <laughs> We'll see if my kids actually make it down here. <laughs> yeah, they want to sit on the floor right here. Can we get some of the bigger kids too? Because this is kind of a big story. So we're going to need some bigger kids' help if they want to come down. Thank you all so much for letting us worship here today. Um, we are going to read a little story. Okay, that's, that's mine. From the book of Acts. And Acts is all about the very first church. Okay? So it says, Life Together. And so while we're reading, I want you to listen, Nancy. I want you to listen to what everybody was doing together. Can you do that? Listen to what they were doing together, okay, Atticus? Okay, Kiki? What are they doing together? On the day the Holy Spirit came with wind and fire, about 3,000 people were baptized and became part of the group of believers. They were amazed by the signs and wonders that the apostles were doing. With great power, the apostles continued to teach them about the resurrection of Jesus. Daily, the people spent time in the temple together, praising God praying and listening to the apostles teach. They joyfully ate meals together in their homes. They remembered Jesus by breaking bread and sharing wine, just as Jesus had done with the disciples. Okay. What did you hear? What were some of the things that they did together? Did you hear? What, what are they doing? Look at the picture. What are some things they're doing? They're eating. What do we do before we eat? Sometimes we pray, right? Pray. Yeah. So I have a church here on our poster board. And we're going to write the next few weeks, whenever we come up here, we're going to talk about some of the things we can do. So some of the things we said we do as a church is we maybe scribe for us. Yeah. We pray and we eat, and we worship God, which we're doing right now, right? But for the first week, we're going to practice praying for each other. So I have a challenge. Are you ready? This week, we're each going to take a post-it, and we're going to pray for another one of our friends up here. Can we do that? Okay. Atticus, if I give you a post-it, can you write your name on it, you think? Okay. Here you go. There's one. We're going to put Kiki's name on one. Nancy, if I give you a post-it, can you write your name? Whoa, oh, whoa. You want to write your name, Kaya? Okay, you go ahead. And then we're going to switch with somebody, and this is the person that we're going to pray for all week. Because that's what we do. As a church, right? We 
we pray for each other. Okay, when you're done, I'll, I'll have your pencil back. And then I'll take your name and we're going to mix them up and then you can pick somebody else to pray with. Pray for. Thank you, Ty. Did you write your name? Perfect. Okay. All right, you got him? Thank you. All right, thank you. Okay, so we're going to practice being the church and praying for each other. Ready? So you're going to pray for Kiki this week. You're going to pray for Kaya. And you're going to pray for Audrey, Kiki. Ramsey's going to pray for Kaya. And Kaya's going to pray for Atticus. And we're going to practice praying for each other like a church. Does that sound good? All right, let's all pray together. Super quick. All right, are you ready? We're going to fold our hands and pray. Can we pray? I know. You have yep. She's the middle child, if that can give you any hint. Um, <laughs> all right. Dear God, thank you so much for today. Thank you for the story about your church. Help us to be like your church and be um, just good at praying for each other this week and keep each other in our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs> Sometimes the eating is more important for uh, the church than praying. Um, <laughs> no, it's all good. <laughs> My kids were upset too that there wasn't more eating. So, <laughs> um, well, good morning, and I want to welcome you here uh, with us here at uh, as Northwest Free Methodist Church at Reflection Ridge. Um, this is a new journey for our church. Um, we have uh, we. Have, we had a building that we just sold a little north here on Tyler Road, um, and so we are excited to share this space and thankful for the warm reception from the staff here at Reflection Ridge. And uh, as we uh, journey together, we are excited to uh, share the good news of Jesus with you and with Wichita. Um, and so over the next eight weeks, our sermon series is going to be going through the Gospel of Mark. Um, the Gospel of Mark is a unique gospel. Uh, most uh, biblical scholars and people believe it is the first gospel written and spread amongst the gatherings of Jesus' followers. And so it is a gospel that drives a lot of the information and stories of the later gospels like Matthew, Luke, and John. Uh, one of the symbols of the Gospel of Mark throughout church history has been a winged lion. Um, and the reason that it is uh, the winged lion is the symbol of the Gospel of Mark is that Mark opens up with a voice crying out in the desert, just like a lion can be heard roaring out. Uh, and so this morning we're going to look at a few verses from chapter 1 to chapter 3, and then I encourage you this week uh, to read from chapter 1 to 3 as you're uh, spending time in, in Scripture. Um, and so the first set of verses that I want to look at is the first four verses. This is the good news about Jesus the Messiah, the Son of God. It began just as the prophet Isaiah had written, Look, I am sending my messenger ahead of you, and he will prepare your way. He is a voice shouting in the wilderness, Prepare the way for the Lord's coming. Clear the road for him. This messenger was John the Baptist. He was in the wilderness and preached that people should be baptized to show that they had repented of their sins and turned to God to be forgiven. This declaration that Mark sets from the, from the beginning of the gospel sets the tone for the rest of the gospel. And he draws on this familiar passage for the Israelites uh, who are following him out in the wilderness, who are being baptized by him. Uh, and so this passage of scripture that he draws from is Isaiah 40, verse 3. It says, listen, 
It's the voice of someone shouting, Clear the way through the wilderness for the Lord. Make a straight highway through the wasteland for our God. Mark's gospel is written somewhere around uh, 60 to 70 AD. Uh, They're not definite on the time. Um, But in that recent history of Israel at that time, in 60 to 70 AD, um, there was a bit of revolution and uh, rebellion going on against the Roman Empire who had occupied them for a few years there. Um, And so this passage which declares a holy movement of God drawing people back into Jerusalem and setting the boundaries right for the Israelites was used as a bit of a call for revolution against Roman oppression and occupation, right? It would be like if we had heard someone quote, uh, you know, you're standing out in the middle of the street and you hear someone say, I have not yet begun to fight, John Paul Jones from the American Revolution. Um, I regret that I only have one life to give to my country, Nathan Hale, or maybe the most famous of all, give me liberty or give me death, right? Those kind of calls for revolution is what Mark is mimicking in the beginning of this gospel. Uh, The listeners that would have come to hear about what John is doing in the desert, what John the Baptist is doing, and what Mark's followers would know is that what is being proclaimed is a bit of a revolution of sorts. And for those listening who are maybe more towards the side of, yeah, we need to kick the Romans out of here, they'd be like, yeah, straight out, like, let's go. Like, let's get the swords out, we're going, we're attacking the Romans. But Mark is proclaiming a different way of how this world works. It's a revolution, certainly, but it's a revolution in the way of Jesus. And so Mark is, at the beginning of of the gospel, is kind of peeking back the curtain on the drama that has been happening throughout all of time. That there is uh, the way of the Lord and the way of sin and death. One leads to life, one leads to death. And so he is peeking, he is pulling back the curtains and saying, look, this has been happening, this is what's going on, but there's going to be a new way for life. And it's coming in from the person who is coming next. I am only preparing the way for Jesus. Um, And so this passage, uh, this passage from Isaiah 40, it would have been uh, an inflection line, but Mark uses it in a totally opposite way. And so he's kind of giving that secret of what God is doing through Jesus. And by secret, a very loud voice in the desert. So not too secret at all. Um, and so if you were reading this gospel for the first time in 80, 60, 70, uh, Mark's readers would already know the end, right? They would be following Jesus. They would have known about his death and resurrection. And so there's nothing really secret here for Mark's readers. And so while Mark is, uh, using this and he's, he's talking about the way of holy war as Isaiah portrays in chapter 40, The way of Jesus and the way of John the Baptist and the followers of Jesus is a very different way. It's a way of suffering, and it's one filled with the confrontation of evil, and it's one that is guiding towards uh, suffering and crucifixion. And so the way of Jesus may seem powerless as you read this story. But Mark is here to proclaim that this is not the way of powerlessness, but the way of the power of God. And so he begins by providing opportunities to show you how Jesus has been empowered by the Spirit to attack evil and confront evil. But the way that this begins, the beginning step of all of this is repentance. John the Baptist makes clear in this verse that you must repent of your sins and turn to God to be forgiven. If you want to join the one who is coming, if you want to join the revolution, you can't just expect, to ha- expect it to happen while you're going about your day. This revolution that is coming in the way of Jesus and the joining of this revolution is done by the repentance and mercy of God. If you want to clear the road, if you want to join the fight, repent. And so Mark, in this gospel, is making it clear from the first four verses 
This revolution of Jesus is not the revolution you were looking for. You think this is the one to get Rome off your backs? It will, but not through swords. Mark is aptly portrayed by a lion because he doesn't waste any time. He is to the point from the beginning. The Lord is coming, repent and have mercy and, and seek forgiveness. The beauty of the Gospel of Mark is that he is preparing you for the journey ahead. The remainder of this first chapter is a proclamation of divine power of Jesus through his baptism. He gathers his first disciples in the first chapter, and then he is accosted by an evil spirit, which he then casts out of the man. And so, in relation to this theme of revolution, this is a significant beginning of the story. Because while we may, while the readers of Mark and the followers of Jesus and the followers of John thought maybe this was the time the restoration of Israel, the kingdom is going to be rebuilt, what Jesus confronts immediately is darkness and brokenness. And the first bit of resistance to this revolution happens with that. Jesus does not choose to start in Jerusalem or Caesarea, which were the hubs of Roman activity. He, heart, he starts in Galilee, in the desert, in the backward ways. So Mark is already, from the beginning of this gospel, letting you know this revolution is not the revolution you are waiting for. He is teaching on God, and he tells people the good news is here. So then Jesus deals with this opposing spirit, and people proclaim he must have authority or power. This must be true, because even the evil spirits listen to him. The revolution of Jesus is against the brokenness and sin of this world. But the revolution of Jesus is not just for the people that are gathering around him. Uh, in the continuation of chapter 1, verse 32, it says, That evening after sunset, many sick and demon-possessed people were brought to Jesus. The whole town gathered to watch the door, gathered at the door to watch. So Jesus healed many people who were sick with various diseases, and he cast out many demons. But because the demons knew who he was, he was not allowed for them to he, he did not allow them to speak. Before daybreak the next morning, Jesus got up and went out to an isolated place to pray. Later Simon and the others went out to find him. When they found him, they said, Everyone is looking for you. But Jesus replied, We must go on to other towns as well, and I will preach to them too. That is why I came. So he traveled throughout the region of Galilee, preaching in the synagogues and casting out demons. The news of Jesus is not just bound for the people that come to him, it is for everybody. Everybody is worth wholeness from their brokenness. The revolution of Jesus is not about power or overthrowing governments, it is about the completion of wholeness for humanity. The restoration of people from their, possess from their demon possession or ailments or in the grand scheme of everything, their sin and separation from God. The revolution of Jesus, Mark starts off with, is a simple but life-changing revolution. Right? Some revolutions are pretty complex. Uh, they take a lot of time. Right? Think about the internet, started in the 90s, but now everything's on the internet. You can't do anything without the internet. Um, but if you ask me to explain how the internet works, I could not. <laughs> um, the automobile completely changed life, right? Uh, you, but I, you know, for the life of me, I could not tell you how it works. <laughs> um, uh, as my wife can well attest, I am not the one to be doing uh, uh, car work. Um, but this revolution, this revolution of Jesus is simple. That you are worthy and deserving of wholeness. The brokenness you have experienced is not the intention of God, nor is it the way that the Lord wants this world to work. You simply have to repent of the part, the part that you have played in the way this works and make clear the way of the Lord. And so Jesus, what Jesus is offering is that the old and new can't go together. The old ways of this world cannot go together, and the new way that Jesus is bringing cannot coexist with the old way. And so we have this... Uh, verse in chapter 2 that ex happens to be where Jesus kind of explains this in verse 18. Once when John's disciples and the Pharisees were fasting, some people came to Jesus and asked, why don't your disciples fast like John's disciples 
and the Pharisees do. Jesus replied, Do wedding guests fast while celebrating with the groom? Of course not. They can't fast while the groom is with them, but someday the groom will be taken away from them, and then they will fast. Besides, who would patch old clothing with new cloth? For the new patch would shrink and rip away from the old cloth, leaving an even bigger tear than before. And no one puts new wine into old wineskins, for the wine would burst the wineskins, and the wine and the skins would both be lost. New wine calls for new wineskins. My old ways, your old ways, are incompatible with this revolution that Jesus is bringing. The way of Jesus is an upsetting, world-changing way of life. The statement and the, the part of what God is doing and what Mark is pro proclaiming of what God is doing is that the healings and teachings of Jesus upset the order of power. It was humans with the fear of losing their power over the religious system they had set up that they, that threatened Jesus, right? Evil spirits had no power, he cast them out. Illnesses had no power, he healed them. Jesus is bringing wholeness to the mess of people's lives when he is out in the countryside. But the minute the Pharisees and the power brokers uh, realize what is happening, that they realize that Jesus is a threat. If all you have to do is repent and have this wholeness, that can't be true. Right? What about the rules? What about the things that make us, us? And it's in chapter 3 that we see this, at the beginning of chapter 3, verse 1 through 6. Jesus went into the synagogue again and noticed a man with a deformed hand. Since it was a Sabbath, Jesus' enemies watched him closely. If he healed the man's hand, they planned to accuse him of working on the Sabbath. Jesus said to the man with the deformed hand, Come and stand in front of everyone. Then he turned to his critics and asked, Does the law permit good deeds on the Sabbath, or is it a day for doing evil? Is this a day to save life, or is it to, to destroy it? But they wouldn't answer him. He looked around at them angrily and deeply saddened by their hard hearts. Then he said to the man, Hold out your hand. So the man held out his hand and was restored. At once the Pharisees went away and met with the supporters of Herod to plot how to kill Jesus. Uh, this part of Mark I always I really like. Because I feel like it's, um, you know, after any sort of sporting event, the head coach has to get up and stand in front of the press and explain either how great they won or how terrible his team did and try to explain it away, right? And recently, uh, if you're into sports at all, some of the coaches have been getting rather testy about these questions. And I feel this is a bit like Jesus. He says, hey, come here. Should I do it or should I not? You know, so sometimes the coach is like, I don't know why I'm losing. You figure it out. Um, and so this, I think, is a picture of the humanness of Jesus. But this is the moment where the long road of suffering and the path towards crucifixion begin. From this moment onward, the path has been set by those who are opposed to Jesus. The path Mark sets before us in the first three chapters is about the revolutionary way of Jesus, the way of repentance, the way of wholeness, and the way of restoration. Everything Jesus has done from being baptized with his spirit to healing the man on the Sabbath is to correct the brokenness of this world. Everything he is doing is pointing us towards the full restoration of this world. But these three chap these first three chapters are also telling another story. The more Jesus pushes towards restoration simply by faith and repentance, the more pushback he gets because it will upset the balance of power. Part of the good news of Jesus is that if you want to upset the world, if you want the world to change, repent and follow him. Offer healing where you can, offer restoration where you can. Maybe you can't heal people's bodies, but can we make it safer for people to exist in this world? Can we call for justice and wholeness with every part of our being? The revolution of Jesus is not simply a change in me or you, it's not just personal or individual. It's larger and bigger than that. Right? If someone is out in the countryside healing people, proclaiming that there's a new way to live life, and that it's simply by repentance, I think there'd be some people who would be upset about that. And so this revolution of Jesus we are offered by repentance of grace, which moves us towards change in this world because it is not the peace of God that he desires, that one day he will restore again. 
The Lord is doing a new work in Jesus and providing a new path for us out of our brokenness and sin. In the early church, there was an uh, early teaching manual for Christians called the Didache. And in that teaching manual, it talks about how Christians are supposed to act. And this is what it says. It says, they love one another, and from widows they do not turn away their esteem. And they deliver the orphan from him who treats him harshly. And he who has gives to him who has not without boasting. And when they see a stranger, they take him into their homes and rejoice over him as a very brother. For they do not call them brethren after flesh, but brethren after spirit and in God. The early church was taught that the way of Jesus, this revolutionary way of Jesus, is welcoming. It's forgiving. It's restoring. Right? Delivering the orphan from him who treats him harshly. Gives to those who has not. Welcomes a stranger into their home and calls him a brother. And so the, the questions that I think we need to ask ourselves as we read this gospel is have we repented to join the revolution? Have we repented of the ways of this world, the ways that are against Jesus, the ways that seek power over people, the ways that destroy life, the ways that bring heartache and betrayal to this world? Have we repented of those ways? And if we have repented of those ways, how should we engage the world to bring more wholeness? What needs healing? What is broken that needs mending? Jesus, in the beginning of Mark's gospel, does not spend a lot of time talking about what the kingdom of God is like. He spends a lot of time doing what the kingdom is like. The only words of instruction in chapter 1 is repent of your sins and believe the good news. That's all Jesus has to say. There is a lot of heartache and brokenness in this world. We've all been impacted by betrayal, anger, hate, vengeance, and malice. This is not the way the world works. This is not the way the world is supposed to work. Repent of those things and follow Jesus to bring the good news of healing. Becoming part of this revolution means growing in love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And so the beginning of this Gospel of Mark is setting the tone for the rest of the Gospel. Confrontation of evil and a new path forward. And so as we continue through this, uh, this Gospel and as we, as we read along in different parts of this Gospel over the next eight weeks, um, we're going to see how God is bringing people into this revolutionary way of Jesus. What people are desiring out of Jesus, what Jesus is providing people. And so he is bringing a new way forward. And so we are, we are part of this opportunity to be part of this new way. Will you join me in prayer? Lord, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for the revolutionary way of Jesus, that we do not have to be bound by sin and heartache, that we do not have to live in the ways of this world, that we can repent and enter a new way. We ask that you be with us as we go about our week, that you would be with us as we um, see brokenness in our world, and that you would urge us to offer healing where we can, and that you would urge us to love those that we have trouble loving, that you would be present as we have the courage to join the revolution of Jesus. We ask for these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I invite you all to stand one last time as we end our Sunday service.
benediction is from Ephesians 3. It is Paul's prayer for the Ephesians. And it says, This is why I, kneel, why I kneel before the Father. Every ethnic group in heaven or on earth is recognized by him. I ask that he will strengthen you in your inner selves from the riches of, the riches of his glory through the Spirit. I ask that Christ will live in your hearts through faith as a result of having strong roots in love. I ask that you'll have the power to grasp love's width and length, height and depth, together with all believers. I ask that you'll know the love of Christ that is beyond knowledge, so that you may be filled entirely with the fullness of God. Glory to God, who is able to do far beyond all that we could ask or imagine by his power at work within us. Glory to him in the church and in Christ Jesus for all generations, forever and always. Amen. Thank you for joining us this morning. Uh, we look forward to continuing to be meeting here and worshiping with you. Uh, we are so excited and thankful for this opportunity. Go in peace and have a great and wonderful uh, Sunday afternoon. Go Chiefs! <laughs>